Hello, my name is Lawrence Spear from the OECD's Public Affairs and Communications Directorate. I'd like to welcome you today to our second webcast on the OECD G20 BEPS project. Our aim today is to provide you with further information on the BEPS 2014 deliverables and update you on the progress of work to date. Since the last webcast a couple of months ago, uh, a number of discussion drafts have been published and uh, this webcast will focus specifically on the content of these discussion drafts. Um, I have the pleasure of welcoming back today Pascal Santamons, who is the Director for Tax Policy Administration here at the OECD, as well as some of the key members of the Secretariat staff who are working on the uh, BEPS project. Um, we'll be hearing today from Rafael Russo, who's the head of the BEPS project. He'll tell us about the report on the tax challenges of the digital economy. We'll also hear from Achim Kos, who's the head of International Cooperation Tax Administration Division. Um, he will discuss the work on hybrid mismatch arrangements. Uh, we'll also hear from Marlies de Reuter, head of the Tax Treaty Transfer Pricing and Financial Transactions Division, who will talk to us about the uh, treaty abuse issues. And finally, we'll hear from Joe Andrews, the head of the Transfer Pricing Unit, who will be telling us about country-by-country -country reporting. Based on uh, comments that we've had from you from the first webcast, we'll be making all the slides available, and uh, we will naturally take the time to answer your questions uh, after the various presentations. Um, we'll also encourage you to put questions to us. You'll see on your uh, screen there a place where uh, the questions can be uh, forwarded. Um, we'll try to take as many of those questions as possible. Right now I'm going to hand over to Pascal, who will get us started with a brief overview of the recently released discussion drafts and the recent developments. Pascal. Thanks a lot, Larry, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you, depending on where, where you are on Earth. Uh, very glad to brief you as, as we committed to. We have decided to deliver regular webcasts so that you are all informed uh, directly from the source of the information delivered to you so that you know what's going on, where we stand, and what's next. And uh, we'll uh, deliver a webcast mainly focused on substance, even though I will say a few words on the process right now. And the, the first key message, I think, for you all is uh, this is happening. We're on track. Uh, all the measures to be delivered in September 14 are being developed and will be ready for uh, being reported to the finance ministers in September 14 with the Committee on Fiscal Affairs, uh, which is our board, which decides on the changes to be introduced in the standards, uh, to be meeting in, in June. Uh, as you know, we have issued four discussion drafts over the past uh, few weeks or few months. Uh, the first one you've talked a lot about, uh, because it's, it's a key one, is the country-by-country -country reporting, which was issued at the end of January. Uh, more recently, we issued a long paper on tax treaty abuse. Uh, this was mid-March, and uh, you still uh, are on time to comment uh, on this paper. The hybrid mismatch arrangements was uh, released a few days uh, later. You still have time to comment on it, and that's the same for the report, the draft report on the digital economy. As you know, this is action one, and that's uh, the only action with action 15 where what will be delivered is a report and not only changes to the existing uh, standards. We have three other 2014 deliverables, which are also on track, even though there is no public consultation on them because they are of a purely intergovernmental nature, and therefore there is uh, no draft to be discussed by the public. Uh, these are Action 5 on harmful tax uh, practices, where we're making significant uh, progress. Uh, well, Action 8 uh, has been released long ago. We have received 1,100 pages of comments showing your interest in this. Working Party 6 has met again, and uh, uh, Joe and Molly will later on uh, brief you on, on where we stand on this. And finally, Action 15, which is of great interest to both the governments and uh, the uh, business community or the NGOs, is about the multilateral instrument. Uh, and here also we'll, we are developing a report. Finally, we have started all the work on the 2015 deliverables, uh, and uh, the working parties have already been discussing this, but uh, there is not yet any paper ready for public consultation. This will come in the second part of the year. 
the uh, plan public consultation, you have the dates. Uh, I don't go through them, but it's uh, quite critical for you all to comment. And all those of you who will have commented and who will have sent uh, comments which are striking or which are new or which are important will be invited in addition to all the people who have registered for these public consultations. Uh, I would also like to mention that uh, we are extensively consulting developing countries, as requested by the G20. Uh, we had four regional uh, meetings uh, to engage with developing countries, one uh, which was held in Seoul with Southeast Asia countries, one in Colombia for Latin American countries, one in South Africa with African Tax Administration Forum, and one in Paris with all the French-speaking uh, African countries, uh, and uh, out of all that, uh, we are drawing uh, lessons, we are drawing comments, and we had a wrap-up session after the Global Forum on Transfer Pricing. Uh, this Global Forum on Transfer Pricing was attended by 111 countries with more than 300 delegates showing the interest and showing that the OECD is the place to be uh, uh, to discuss uh, this type of issues. And you may have noted that uh, the governments were invited to nominate people to attend a tax symposium, uh, which will be held by the G20 Presidency Australia in Tokyo. This will take place in Tokyo on the 9th and 10th of May uh, in the coming weeks. Um, the review of the consultation with developing countries, just a few words quickly. Uh, most of the actions of the action plan are considered as key priorities, but uh, some more interest uh, has been expressed as regards interest deductibility, other base eroding payment, treaty abuse, transfer pricing actions. Uh, clearly, in these actions, the developing countries are willing to input, and they will be uh, able uh, to input. Uh, some other issues which are not included in the BEPS action plan uh, have been raised as source of concerns for developing countries, in particular, uh, the tax incentives uh, and, uh, of course, capacity building and awareness uh, raising. The IMF is involved, is consulted in the report we are preparing for the G20 Development uh, Working Group. The IMF, we know, is also concerned with uh, what they call I indirect transfer of interest, which may be something now in the landscape of BEPS as regards uh, developing countries. And uh, all this will be included in the report to the G20 Development Working Group, which meets in Washington in a few weeks and then in May, and a report uh, will be presented uh, to this group. Now, I will leave the floor uh, to my colleagues uh, who are in charge of uh, the different substantial uh, topics. Uh, we'll brief you on the digital economy, on hybrid mismatches, on tax treaty abuse, on transfer pricing aspects of intangible, on transfer pricing uh, and country-by-country -country reporting, transfer pricing documentation and country-by-country -country reporting. Uh, and we'll try to respond to as many questions as possible. You're invited to send questions right now, so please do not hesitate, and we'll try uh, to find the time to uh, respond to them. We have one hour, we'll not exceed, but uh, in that time span, we, we hope to respond to your questions. So, Thanks for attending, and uh, I will uh, now uh, turn to my colleagues. Thank you. Thanks very much, Pascal. We'll definitely get to hear more from Pascal shortly. Um, to begin with, I'm going to turn the floor over to Rafael Russo, who's going to talk about progress to date, um, of the work on the digital economy, and the recently released uh, discussion draft. Rafa. Thank you, Larry, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the discussion draft on the tax challenges of the digital economy was, uh, was published about 10 days ago. Uh, what uh, the discussion draft does is basically to provide uh, the public with the current thinking of the uh, task force. And uh, it does contain an overview of developments of um, information and communication technology over time, really starting from the first desktops to uh, smartphones, connected objects, and um, electronic uh, uh, coin. Uh, that uh, are uh, common today. Uh, on the basis of this analysis of the evolution of the digital economy, the preliminary conclusion of the report is that it is not possible uh, nor useful to ring fence the digital economy. Why? Because the digital economy is actually increasingly the economy itself, and a number of sectors like logistics, like manufacturing, financial services, education, media, but even healthcare and agriculture are being impacted by the uh, digital uh, revolution. And therefore, what the discussion draft does is to focus on the key features of the digital economy that warrant attention 
uh, uh, from a tax policy making point of view. These key features include mobility in the sense of mobility of assets, uh, in particular intangibles, mobility of employees, and also mobility of, of customers. The heavy reliance on data, and in particular big data, which is now uh, made possible by the huge increase in, in computing power worldwide, the multi-sided nature of many of these business models where effectively the actions of one group of customers <coughs> produces effects uh, in relation to another group of customers, network effects, and a tendency to monopoly or oligopoly in a number of areas together with the volatility that uh, characterizes the, the digital um, economy. The report also provides an overview of a number of different and new uh, business models and uh, tries to capture the value of some of these business models in, in monetary terms, going from electronic commerce that is growing, um, application stores, and also internet advertising. Mm -hmm. On the basis of that analysis, it then focuses on, on the BEPS structures that have been encountered in relation to those. And uh, it reaches the preliminary conclusion that there are no unique BEPS issues that, uh, that relate to the digital economy, but at the same time, some of the key features of the digital economy, and this applies in particular to mobility, to the use of data, and to network effects that can exacerbate some of these issues from both an income and a consumption tax uh, perspective. What the discussion draft then does is effectively to identify how uh, these features of the digital economy should be taken into account when the work on the other actions included in the action plan is, is, uh, is carried out, and how the result of that work is expected to have an impact on BEPS, so effectively restoring source and residence taxation where it uh, belongs. Following that, the report analyzes some of the challenges that had already been identified in the, in the BEPS action plan. And these challenges uh, go beyond BEPS and can be seen as more uh, systemic. They include the possibility of doing business uh, at a large scale in a country without the need to be physically present there, uh, whether and how uh, value should be attributed to data, and in particular personal data, and the tax uh, characterization issues that relate in particular for payments under uh, cloud computing uh, business models, together with certain consumption tax uh, aspects. What the discussion draft then does is to provide a description of the option that have been presented uh, to the task force and for which, on which the task force had an initial discussion. It's clear that there is more work to be done, but at the same time the task force thought it was important to request input from uh, stakeholders on the analysis that has been done and on the options that have been uh, proposed. Uh, next steps, um, the deadline for comments is uh, 14th of April. There will be a public consultation on the 23rd of April that will also be uh, 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 um, uh, possible to follow why, via a webcast. And then the plan for the discussion draft that will become the final report is to add a section, a chapter, on the fundamental principles of, of taxation and what's the distinction between income tax and consumption tax and what are the principles underlying uh, double tax treaties. Further work to be done to develop and put more flesh around the bones of the options that have been uh, presented and then define a framework in order to analyze uh, these options together with some more detailed examples of BEP structures that have been encountered in, um, in the digital economy. The discussion drafts contains a number of uh, questions for input uh, from stakeholders. Uh, as, as I mentioned, many of these conclusions, if not all, are preliminary conclusions of the task force. So questions range from, is it right uh, to say that it's not possible to ring fence the digital economy? Are there other key features that should be taken uh, into account? And uh, do you agree that uh, the development of the BEPS uh, measures in the course of the BEPS project will actually uh, address the BEPS issues raised by the, the digital economy? Are there other options that, that should be taken into account? Uh, as I mentioned, we really do look forward to uh, comments and to the public consultation on the 23rd of April. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rafa. 
Um, without uh, hesitating, we'll just move straight forward to talk about the two discussion drafts on hybrid mismatches that were issued two weeks ago, and I'll turn the floor straight over to Achim Kos. Achim. Thank you, Larry, um, and I'm going to talk about uh, the hybrid mismatches here. So I've been given the task of condensing a highly technical and complicated document of more than 80 pages into an easy-to-understand four-minute presentation, and then also focus you on some of the key questions we want your input, and I guess since we're having feedback at the end, you can tell me whether I've been successful in this endeavor. Um, so, so turning to the slide, then first, we try to arrange it by a series of questions to give you a flavor, really, what's the substance here, and focus less, less on the process question. First, to be clear, what are we talking about? What is a hybrid mismatch arrangement? Many of you know, but this term is out and is also used for different things. So when we talk about a hybrid mismatch arrangement for purposes of this work here, it's an arrangement that exploits the different tax treatment in two jurisdictions to produce a mismatch in tax outcomes. And that mismatch is either two deductions for the same payment or it's a deductible payment that's not included in income by the recipient. And when I say not included in income by the recipient, what we mean is it is because of the nature of the instrument. So the rule will turn it into gross income. Whether that then is taxed is a separate question. And if it's not taxed because the entity receiving the income is, for instance, a charity or it's got loss carry forwards, then that's not a problem. Also, what's important, what we're not looking at. So we're not looking at sort of instruments that have a flavor of debt and equity, but within the classification of one country. And we're also, importantly, not at looking between differences of regulatory classification and tax classification. As long as on the tax classification, we have consistency within the scope of the rule. So that's what we mean when we talk about a hybrid mismatch arrangement. Then, then where are we? Well, we are um, on action item two. Uh, we, we, for once, we, we were actually ahead of schedule, so we released a little early. Um, on the 19th of March, comments are due by May 2nd, and we all encourage you to really bring in these comments, and there is a public consultation on the 15th of May. For those that don't know where to find the document, the link is at the bottom of the page. It is on our website, and we really encourage all of you uh, to come in and provide comments. Uh, what are we trying to achieve here? I guess this is one of the next questions here. Well, well, two things. One, we try to come up, and this is a 214 deliverable, we, we try to come up with recommendations for domestic law changes and changes to the OECD model convention to deal with hybrids. Importantly here, how are we trying to achieve this? We want to develop rules that are, first of all, clear. Clear means also easy to apply for tax administration and taxpayers. And in the process of designing clear rules, of course, this also has an impact on scope. How wide do we go with this rule? It has an impact on compliance costs. Second, we want to make them automatic. And that means they apply mechanically. So we will not require that a tax administration establishes whether uh, this type of transaction has specifically had the main purposes of avoiding country A versus country B. We have experiences. This is a difficult test. It's probably an unnecessary test when, as in this exercise, you actually come together collectively and define a rule as opposed to one country going on its own. Three, we talk about comprehensive rule. We talk about comprehensive rule because there's no point in closing down hybridity with respect to one particular instrument just to open it up somewhere else. We don't want to dislocate one thing from this place over to here. So it needs to be comprehensive. I think that's in the interest of both business and governments. And then we say neutralize the tax mismatch, and that's, that's important. We're focusing on the tax mismatch. We're not going and going to disturb the commercial or regulatory consequences. I've made that. And when we say neutralize the tax mismatch, we're also making sure that we're not going from double non-taxation to double taxation. Um, and then last, before I get to the next slide, I guess some people have asked, well, why are you even working in this space? And it could be another question. We're working in this space uh, because uh, there's issues, there's real issues of competitiveness and there's issues of fairness. We cannot allow a double deduction to be taken on one single expense. If this is available only for certain taxpayers, if it's not available for small and medium-sized enterprises that only operate in the domestic economy. And also we've got to make sure that we have coherence here. This is where this falls under the overall BEPS plan. That's where it links up a coherence of the international tax architecture. And let me then come uh, to the next part, and that's like the report itself. Um, as I said, I'm going to focus here on the domestic aspects rather than the treaty aspects because we think that probably most of the questions are going to be on the domestic side. So that's why I'm, I'm focusing on, on, on these for now. The report covers three areas. 
mainly hybrid financial instruments, including transfers. So we're looking at debt equity type hybrids. We're looking wider as well. We're also looking at repo structures. And we've put the instruments together with the transfers because they raise similar issues. Second, we look at payments made by hybrid entities that give rise to a duplicate deductions or no inclusion e outcomes. And I've talked about what we mean by the inclusion, the difference, the nature of the agreement and the instrument as opposed to the actual taxation of the item of income. And third, we're talking about imported mismatch structures. That is typically where it's in the other countries where the uh, effect is being imported in the first country. That category is going to be less relevant if we get every country to agree to adopt those rules. Um, the mechanics, I guess, is linking rules. So what we do is we base the tax treatment of a hybrid on the tax treatment in the other state. So if you wish, we are recreating the sort of symmetry that exists in a closed system, in a domestic system, but that we otherwise lose when the transaction goes across a border. So we want to make this holistic. We want to recreate the symmetry in the space again. We're going to do this by either denying a deduction for a payment or, alternatively, requiring that item of income to be included in income. So we have two rules. And so we operate on the basis of a primary and a secondary rule ordering to determine which jurisdiction applies its rule first. And we do this for two reasons. We do this, one, because we need to design a system that works even if not every country in the world adopts the rules. And so that will determine in part which rule is going to be applied. But also, two and equally important, we have a system that does not take us from double non-taxation to double taxation, even where all countries apply the rules. So that's why we need the rule ordering as well. And that takes me to, to the last slide here, which is really the questions, the engagement, the dialogue that we wish to have with you. We have put in a series of questions in the public consultation document itself, and that is clearly where we think that we need input. But we are clear we're not knowing everything. And so the second point here is really we're interested on feedback from you. Are there other questions that we missed? Are there particular aspects of the rules that in their practical application are very difficult to do? Are there as other aspects that we may have overlooked? So we're really looking at we've thrown out a bunch of questions. We think those are relevant questions as we are in the process of developing the paper. But clearly, we may have overlooked items. And so we're also seeking input on questions that we may not have asked. Um, and, and last, uh, one thing that we already know uh, that is going to be challenging and where we have two options really in the paper is a question particularly around the scope of the rules around hybrid financial instruments. There is much support for the notion that these rules should apply the rules for hybrid financial instruments to related parties, but also wider to parties acting in concert and also to structured arrangements. You have some indications of what we mean by structured arrangement. It is not a purpose test. It is an objective test when, 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 when for instance, it is priced into the transaction. <coughs> Where we're still developing is what is the better approach or how can we translate that into a conceptual approach? Is it better to try to define what is in specifically and whatever is not defined as in is out? Or is it better to bring everything in and then to try to carve out? So you need to be in the exception. If you're not in the exception, you're in. And that raises different implications. And, and that's one of the key features where we're really seeking input. And that's also the last question here on the slide, the perceived impact of the approach to scope on hybrid financial instruments with respect to compliance costs, with respect to the workability of the system, and also, of course, questions for governments in the administration of those rules. So I leave you with these questions. Um, uh, uh, leave it to say that um, I hope it was clear. Uh, as I said, it's important that we get the input so we develop rules in that space that are practical, sustainable, and that can be implemented at the lowest possible compliance cost. Thank you, Larry. Thanks very much, Achim. Um, we'll now turn to uh, Marlies Zoreiter, who will talk about the discussion draft on preventing treaty abuse, which was released for public comments on the 14th of March. Marlies? Thank you very much, uh, Larry. And um, yes, the, as I said, the discussion draft was released pretty uh, recently. Um, as I also reflected in the previous webcast, it, it kind of goes back to three elements. The first is preventing the granting of treaty benefits in uh, inappropriate circumstances. Treaty provisions can be used either to, 
prevent limitations of the treaty itself, but it can also be used to um, circumvent application of the domestic law. And we want to make sure that uh, it's clarified that certain abusive situations should not be limited by the treaty. Uh, secondly, what we are going to do is to clarify that tax treaties are not intended to generate double non-taxation. So when courts interpret the treaties, that they know that um, in certain situations, governments intended a very limited application of the treaty and not, for example, to open it up to uh, treaty shopping. And, and third, we also want to reflect the, treaty, the tax policy considerations to consider before entering into a treaty. Um, during this webcast, I will go mainly into the issue um, that is reflected under A. And, and I would also like to say something about process very, very shortly. As said, the discussion draft was released on the 14th of March. Uh, comments are required by the 9th of April, and the consultation meeting will be held on the 14th. And, and there is one thing that is not in the draft that was only communicated in the press release that is very important. For, for those people that want to participate in the public consultation, there is another deadline, and that's the deadline of the 3rd of April, so that's tomorrow. And, and tomorrow, you can, before, before tomorrow, you need to register to be at the public consultation meeting, and you also need to convey your interest if you want to speak at this meeting. So I would just like to ask those of you listening that want to be at the meeting to be aware of that, because we have pretty limited registration and, and, and speakers lined up at the moment. Then um, I would like to go into the prevention of the granting of treaty, treaty benefits in inappropriate circumstances. And, and one of the things that got the most attention so far in, in the area of BEPS is the uh, issue of treaty shopping. And, and to the issue of treaty shopping, the draft kind of takes a three-pronged approach. First of all, what we do is indicate in the preamble to the treaty that in a very clear statement that what we want to do is to wish um, that we wish to avoid tax avoidance, but also especially that it's not the intention to create uh, treaty sh shopping possibilities. So, so with that, it's already indicating that it's, it's meant to be a bilateral treaty, and it's not meant that if you create a treaty with one country that it opens up a treaty with the world. The, the second thing that um, is part of this three-pronged approach is a specific anti-abuse rule that is like the, the, the limitation of benefits rule that is um, adopted by the, by the United States. And, and such a rule addresses treaty shopping based on the legal nature of the ownership in and the general activities of residents of contracting states. And um, with that rule, we are convinced that we provide certainty because it's a very objective rule um, and that it will prevent many of the treaty shopping situations. Some of the country delegates that have not used a limitation of benefits rule are a bit concerned about the complexity, about the administrative costs. So it, for, for those companies having experiences with these, with these provisions, it would be very good to comment, for example, on, on their experiences with that. Um, one of the major questions that was discussed in this area was whether we would include a derivative benefits rule in the limitation of benefits provision. And um, delegates were not sure about that because they saw a, the, a risk in inclusion of such a rule. And the risk they saw was to give trade benefits to income that would ultimately not be taxed, also not at the parent level. So uh, therefore, in the draft, we have included a very specific question for business and for other people commenting. And, and those questions are that if included, how could we target the BEPS concern that we have seen? So the fact of non-inclusion at the parent level. And then um, if we would include, or, or if we would not include, um, what kind of positive examples could we give to make sure that those situations that need to be, um, to get a green light, that need to be approved, are actually approved under this provision? 
So that is the second part of the three-pronged approach. And then the third part, and that will probably get a lot of comments uh, from, from, from people, because what we have also included is a more general provision. Because what we recognize is that with the limitation of benefits provision alone, we do not um, address all treaty abuse situations and also not all treaty shopping situations. For example, some conduit financing um, arrangements cannot be addressed with the lim limitation on benefits provision. So that's why we have included a main purpose rule, and that main purpose rule does two things. First of all, it says that if one of the main purposes is to get the treaty benefits, um, that this rule may apply, but then it says that the obtaining of the benefits should be contrary to the objective and purpose of the relevant treaty. So with that, we try to balance that we say, no, it's not always that you know, the treaty benefit is a, a, a consideration that you would deny the benefits. You will only deny it if it's uh, contrary to the objective and purpose of the relevant treaty. And we have included some examples where we say, of course, in such situations, the main purpose rule should not apply, or in such situations, the main purpose rule should apply. And what we would welcome very much is uh, also other examples uh, of situations um, where it should or should not apply. Um, and I think one of the things that I should also specify is that uh, it is recognized in the discussions uh, that um, the main purpose rule um, needs to provide a lot of clarity because there, there is uncertainty um, in the, the rule itself. Uh, so we would also invite comments about you know, whether such uh, concerns about a main purpose rule are taken care of by the fact that we have, in, uh, have indicated that should be contrary to the purpose and objective of the treaty and by taking account of the examples that we have included. <coughs> then I think that says all about the treaty shopping. Um, then what I would also like to go, go into is um, abuse targeted at circumventing domestic tax law by using treaties. And that goes to the relationship between treaties and domestic anti-abuse rules. And, and, and we want to refine very clearly the analysis in the commentary, and we need to do so, because um, at this moment, uh, we are working on a lot of areas, and Achim has just indicated what we're working on, on hybrid, in, in, uh, hybrid um, mismatches. We're working on thin cap situations. And of course, what we want to do is make sure that those mechanisms work and that there are no treaty provisions that impede countries from using those mechanisms. On the other hand, what we also don't want is that countries introduce mechanisms that more or less override the treaty. So it, it should contain a balance. And that is why, um, with regard to the introduction of new rules, what we need to do is analyze by, on a case-by-case case basis where this, where this balance lies and, and how we should address it. And, and that also definitely goes to the, the, the measures that we have in relation to um, specific, uh, uh, special measures that are indicated in the transfer pricing area. Um, there is one very specific rule that has been indicated already, that's a savings clause, um, and that's a specific rule that we already invite some comments on. So that's it for the treaty abuse stuff. Great. Thank you very much, Marlies. Uh, just point out right now that the deadline for uh, comments on the draft discussion on tax treaty abuse is approaching rapidly. Uh, you still have a week to submit your comments. Please do so. Um, we'll be staying with Marlies for a few moments to hear about the transfer pricing aspects of Intangible's work. Back to you. Thank you very much, Larry. Yes, and, and I can be very quick here. I think uh, we spoke about it uh, before. Uh, we indicated that um, we had been working on this for, for quite some time now already before the BEPS project. Um, we had a very productive meeting the previous week. Uh, tentative agreements uh, are reached on a lot of issues. And I think um, what we indicated before in, in one of our previous that previous uh, consultations and, and, and what 
WP6 has expressed that le legal ownership and funding alone without more activities should not get the intangible related returns. Uh, that goes back to section B of chapter six that we're working on. That is something that we need to work on because um, somewhat more because it also has a close interaction with the future work on uh, risk and recharacterization and, and, and special measures. And one of the things that we want to secure is that um, the special measures that we introduce kind of clearly indicate that the arm's length principle gets, a to, gets us to, to the results that we want to achieve and that I indicated before. Thank you, Larry. Thanks very much, Marlies. Um, we'll now turn to uh, Joe Andrews, who will be talking to us about the work going on in transfer pricing and country-by-country -country reporting. Thank you, Larry. Um, BEPS Action 13 requires the development of improved uh, transfer pricing documentation standards uh, and a country-by-country -country reporting template. Uh, on the 30th of January, uh, we released a discussion draft which was intended to uh, uh, raise issues and uh, generate comment from affected uh, taxpayers. Uh, it succeeded admirably in that regard. Uh, we had more than 150 comment letters on uh, the documentation paper, uh, more than 1,300 pages of uh, comments, and last week uh, we uh, had two very productive days of discussions uh, in Working Party 6 uh, uh, relating to the many comments that had been received. Uh, in the course of those discussions, we were able to reach tentative decisions uh, on a number of issues. I emphasize that these are tentative decisions, that they haven't been reviewed by uh, the CFA Bureau, by the CFA, um, but uh, they are uh, uh, ready for consideration now. Um, those tentative decisions include the following. Uh, first, uh, the country-by-country -country template will not be part of the transfer pricing master file required under the discussion draft, but will instead be a separate, standalone document. The country-by-country -country template will require only aggregate countrywide reporting of financial information, as opposed to the legal entity by legal entity reporting that was part of the discussion draft. The financial data to be reported in each country will include revenue, profit before tax, cash taxes paid, current year tax accrual, the number of total full-time equivalent employees, tangible assets, and capital and accumulated earnings. The transactional reporting that was required in the last six columns of the discussion drafts template will be eliminated, and instead, transactional reporting will be included in the transfer pricing local file only and limited to entities that do business in the local country. While entity-by-entity -entity reporting of financial data will not be required, the country-by-country -country template will require a listing of all group entities whose income and assets are reported in the country-by-country -country template by country. So entities resident in a country will be listed, and together with that listing, there will be required activity codes related to each com company, which will suggest the major activities that those companies engage in. The country-by-country country reporting rules will provide flexibility for business activities uh, or for businesses to, with regard to the source of the financial data that they use in preparing the report, either use of statutory financials or data from the company's uh, consolidated income reporting package may be used provided the same sources of data are used consistently across all countries and from year to year. Um, with regard to the transfer pricing uh, documentation master file, uh, we will modify the language uh, to some degree to make it clearer that what we intend is a high-level overview of the company's uh, business. Um, 
Uh, we had comments from many companies that they thought that uh, completing uh, the requested data in the master file uh, would require thousands of pages of writing. Uh, that was not the intention. We don't think that that's the case, uh, but we want to make it clear that what we're talking about is a fairly high-level overview that will put the business activities of the company in context. And finally, uh, the requirement in the transfer pricing master file to disclose the location of the 25 highest paid uh, employees of the group will be deleted. Um, uh, while we made great progress in arriving at those decisions, uh, there are still a number of issues under consideration. Uh, one of those issues, and probably the key outstanding issue, has to do with the process for filing and sharing the country-by-country -country template among countries. Uh, we will be continuing our discussions on that in the May meeting. Uh, similarly, we need to talk a bit more about the guidance in the draft on the language to be used uh, in preparing uh, the uh, master file and on translation obligations. Uh, the working party will be meeting again in May, and as I indicated before, there will be a uh, uh, public consultation held on the 19th of May. We were anxious to have uh, businesses understand uh, where our thinking has gone before the public consultation so that we can focus on the current thinking uh, as I have just reflected. I think that's all there. Joe, thank you very much, and thanks to all the panelists for those presentations on uh, where we stand right now in the uh, OECD G20 BEPS project. We're going to go right into the questions straight away. We, we've received quite a number of questions, um, both uh, prior to the uh, webcast and now during. So I'm going to read some of these questions out and put them to, to you, the panelists. Um, the first one um, has to do with developing countries. Um, the uh, question suggests that... Um, there are regional consultations with developing countries. These are inputs for a report on the BEPS action plan and its impact on developing countries. Um, the report is for the development working group at the G20. Would it be possible to include issues such as tax incentives or commodities transfer mispricing in the OECD outcomes for the G20 finance track? How can we see the results of regional consultations included in the decision process to implement the BAPS action plan? I think, Pascal, you might want to take that. Thank you, Larry, and thanks for this uh, question. Uh, we have decided to be as inclusive as possible, and that's also an instruction by the G20, which is why we have performed these regional consultations. And uh, the outcome of these consultations, which I've described very uh, in, in briefly, uh, is about to be included in the report to the G20 with some recommendations. There are things which are within the scope of BEPS, and in this case, we'll make sure that the views are reflected, and that's what we did, for instance, last week when holding the Global Forum on Transfer Pricing with 111 countries, which could comment on the drafts. And uh, these were effective comments which can be taken into account. That's one uh, part. The other part is uh, about uh, what we will be recommending to the G20 together with the IMF, the World Bank, the UN, which are helping us uh, developing uh, this report to the G20. And we may recommend new streams of actions uh, to be developed, in particular on tax incentives, even though some might consider it's not a BEPS issue per se, but clearly it's a source of concern with developing countries. And by the way, we're already working working on this, uh, as the Task Force on Tax and Development uh, has already done some work uh, in this area uh, with some country-specific uh, surveys. So we'll keep going on and we'll inform you on the outcome, but be assured that as regards the development of the 15 actions of the action plan, the views of developing countries, as they have been collected through the regional consultation, are being inputted in the work, and uh, we will reconduct uh, the initiative of regional consultation on a regular basis on the way forward. Great, Pascal, thanks very much. Um, we have a question on aggressive tax planning from a journalist in Australia. Is aggressive tax planning based on after-tax hedging, such as asymmetric swaps, under scrutiny as part of the BEPS process? If so, can you explain your current thinking on the issue? Um, maybe Achim, you would take that one. 
Thanks, Larry. Yes, happy to take. Uh, there's, the, there's a short answer at the risk of oversimplifying. Uh, the short answer is, is, is no. Uh, that is not currently the focus of attention. I think we, we've done work in the past um, in this area that provides some of the answers in that space, and I think they're also probably mostly on the tax compliance side, and given that BEPS is a tax policy project, it's, it's not one of the things that we're currently focusing on. Thank you. Um, just moving straight forward, um, a question. Um, are we expecting a new chapter in OECD guidelines on financial transactions? Um, maybe put that to Joe. Thanks, Larry. Uh, I think the short answer to that is yes. Um, uh, action four of the action plan suggests that uh, we will do work on transfer pricing aspects of financial transactions and uh, uh, while we are still working on the scope of that work, it's, it's actually one of the last uh, actions to be delivered uh, under the agenda. Uh, uh, we do anticipate that uh, the most likely output would be a new chapter in the guidelines. Great, thank you. Um, another question, one on the digital economy. How will the work on the digital economy link in with the EU's expert group on this issue? Um, maybe Rafa, you want to take that? Thank you, Larry. Uh, it is actually already linked. Uh, we have uh, given a number of presentations to the expert group. They have uh, seen the, the, the report before it was published, and the EU Commission attends all uh, OECD meetings. Uh, I understand that uh, that, that report will be finalized uh, around May, so that will be also discussed by the task force at its uh, fourth meeting. Thank you. Great. Moving, moving straight into uh, another question. How can the OECD ensure that special measures do not destroy the arm's length principle? Um, Marlies, that one is probably for you. Thank you, Larry. Yes, and um, I think that the, the action plan already said that uh, that the, the countries, the associate countries and the OECD are of the opinion that the arm's length principle works in most situations. So these special measures are only targeted to strengthen the arm's length principle and therefore definitely not uh, to destroy it. The arm's length principle seems to be a popular Topic, um, we have another question similarly. How will the arm's length standard handle the residual value and synergies of a global multinational enterprise? Maybe, Joe, you want to jump in? Yeah, I, th I think the popularity is probably why we keep getting 1,300 pages of comments every time we say anything. But uh, the, uh, I, I think this is an important question. Um, in the intangibles draft, we have, uh, we have, I think for the first time, really tried to take on the question of uh, corporate synergies, um, uh, and that part of the draft, in my view, is one of the more important things uh, that the draft says. It talks about uh, when such synergies should be taken into account, how they should be shared among uh, uh, group members, uh, and, uh, and I think uh, takes the view quite clearly that if all of the uh, valuable inputs uh, of uh, uh, the group of companies uh, are properly valued and properly rewarded, that the notion of some residual pool sitting undefined uh, uh, in the group is probably not a particularly useful idea, uh, and, uh, and therefore not one that uh, needs to be given too much weight. Uh, so the BEPS uh, intention is to make sure that big pools of residual don't get lumped into low-tax jurisdictions, and uh, I think that the intangibles draft goes a long way in the direction of setting out rules that will make sure that that's the case. Thanks very much for that, Joe. I have a couple of questions here on country-by-country -country reporting. Um, there's one that asks, uh, is this really for risk assessment or will it be used for targeted audits? And a second question on country-by-country -country reporting, um, wondering if it's targeted for only at governments or should it also be directed at the general public? Maybe, Joe, you want to go for that one again? Yeah, thank you, Larry. Um, I think um, 
our view of the purpose of the country by country report uh, is that it should be used for risk assessment. Uh, we don't think that the information that is in included uh, in the report uh, in and of itself can be used to allocate income. Uh, we would not expect that it should be used for that purpose, but that it can be used to target an audit to the right taxpayers and to the right issues uh, much more effectively. Uh, the BAPS action plan uh, suggests quite clearly in our view that uh, the country by country report is for uh, tax administrators and for the purpose of more efficient tax administration. And so our current view is that it should not be made public. Very good. Um, a question here, something that we haven't discussed very much, but um, that, that seems interesting. Um, will arbitration be part of the multilateral instrument? Maybe, Pascal, you want to talk to us a little bit about where we stand on that multilateral instrument. Thank you, Larry. Actually, in, in the context of BEPS, we can hear from the business community, but also from a number of governments, that certainty is not increasing and we are very concerned about that because we do think that we need to reduce the, the risks of uncertainty and this is why we do have an action 14 which deals with improving dispute resolution mechanisms. Governments have not been good at eliminating double taxation uh, where one of the parties has made adjustments and these adjustments uh, never uh, result in the elimination of double taxation in the other in the other country. And this is why we want to uh, definitely improve the dispute resolution mechanisms and part of that would be to push for mandatory arbitration. And in the context of Action 15, which deals with the development of a multilateral instrument to translate the BEPS actions related to tax treaties in a more effective manner rather than negotiating 3,000 bilateral treaties which would take uh, decades, uh, maybe we can explore the possibility of having a multilateral convention which would amend all these bilateral treaties automatically. We would be keen on pushing for arbitration to be included there. Now at the end of the day that's for the governments to decide but uh, we hope that uh, there will be an acknowledgement of a need to push for effective dispute resolution mechanisms, which definitely includes uh, better and uh, more frequent arbitration mechanisms. Pascal, I think I have another one here for you. It's a question from a journalist in Ireland who asks if there's an inherent bias against smaller nations involved in creating a greater alignment between taxation and markets. Thanks, Larry, uh, and thanks for the question, and good afternoon to Ireland. Uh, the, the BEPS project is about putting an end to the divorce between the location of the profits and the location of the real activities. That's what it is about. It's not about reducing tax competition. Tax competition is a matter of fact. Some like it, some don't like it. At the OECD, we have nothing against that. We favor, in our tax policy analysis work, we favor low rates, uh, broad bases, and uh, we are aware that uh, small countries can afford lower rates than bigger countries uh, because they don't exactly have the same market, and so be it. What uh, we uh, are concerned with, what our member countries are concerned uh, with, uh, are the situations where you have zero tax to attract not real activity, but to attract the profits through pure contractual arrangements, and uh, that is harming the international tax system. So we do think that uh, the work we are doing on BEPS will reduce, will neutralize the opportunities of locating profit without moving the activity. This actually is also in favor of low tax jurisdictions because instead of competing with artificial zero taxation, they will compete with other countries with maybe higher uh, corporate income tax rates. That's a matter of fact. That's where we are, and I think everybody should understand that. Thank you, Pascal. Um, we have a question here, I think, for Achim because it talks about hybrid mismatches. Um, hybridity occurs very often without planning. And in fact, more often without planning than with planning. Do we really mean to ask these questions in every case not involving planning? Achim? I think when you look through the report and the categories that we've identified, hybrid financial instruments, entity payments, and imported mismatches, I think 
most of these cases we can fairly assume this is not the sort of structure where you happen to fall into it and you had no idea that what was being created is a, is a hybrid here. There are some questions where I think we're really looking into the feasibility of how broad that can be, and that's why every one of these three segments has a particular rule on scope. How wide can you take this? So if you take, for instance, a hybrid instrument that's issued into the market, is it really possible for the issuer to deny the deduction, which would require the issuer to know the tax treatment on the part of the holder? So there's a real question if you happen to be in that space, and you could call it sort of a hybrid by nature, it sort of happens, um, is this something that we can do? And so I think part of your question probably goes to the point of scope. And when we talk about the point of scope, we're fully aware that there may well be certain situations that we need to carve out. And, and the, the example of a financial uh, hybrid instrument that's issued into the market, that's widely held, that's publicly traded, would clearly fall into that category. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Achim. Um, I have a question over here that might be interesting for, um, for Pascal. Um, they're looking for clarification. Um, does BEPS cover the introduction of unitary taxation, or will BEPS recommend the introduction of unitary taxation? If BEPS does make a recommendation for the introduction of unitary taxation, what will be the recommended time frame for the introduction, and what steps would be involved to achieve full implementation, Pascal? Thanks, you, Larry, and thanks uh, for the question, which allows us to clarify, in case it was not clear enough, that the BEPS action plan is not about a move to unitary taxation, nor is it uh, a move towards uh, former apportionment, uh, because there is consensus that the Amsterdam principle is a system which is working with deficiencies that are being addressed, and uh, I think the members of uh, the OECD as well as the non-members which are associated to the BEPS project recognize that uh, the Amsterdam principle is appropriate uh, but needs to be fixed. So that's what we are doing. There is no intent to move to another system. Uh, this has been explored and the conclusions, the preliminary conclusions are that this is just not possible. So let's fix the existing systems, which will allow us, by the way, to save the Amsterdam principle. The risk we face is that some country is not being happy with the outcome of the Amsterdam principle might walk away from the consensus. We don't want this to happen because we are fully aware that the companies, the governments, all, all the people need certainty and the Amsterdam principle is in a good shape to provide certainty as long as the implementation of the Amsterdam principle does not result in something which is nonsense. When all the profit, and intangible in particular, ends up in a jurisdiction where there is not only no tax, but absolutely no real activity of any kind. We are not achieving the goal of the Amsterdam principle as it was designed back in the 1920s, which is just to share the right to tax among countries and making sure that countries can tax what accrues on their territory. So that's what we're doing. So no formal reapportionment, uh, no unitary taxation. There is no hidden agenda, but on the contrary, fixing the Amsterdam principle, as Joe and Marlies have explained earlier. Um, the hour is approaching. I think we have time for one final question, which may actually serve as a conclusion of sorts. Pascal, I'm going to put this one to you as well. Um, there's growing speculation that high-tech companies with intellectual property in countries like Bermuda will end their double Irish structures as a result of the proposed transfer pricing changes that would reduce the profits that can be attributed to countries where there is nothing other than legal ownership. Can you comment on the prospects for such a change? Well, that's, that's a very good question. Maybe it's wishful thinking, but the answer is, yeah, probably. That's what we are expecting. That's what we would be encouraging. The, the world is changing, and we can see that uh, there are already actions taken by some member countries. And, and here we say, well, please wait. Wait so that this is coordinated. And that's why we're doing the BEPS action plan in a very limited time period, so that we can provide instruments before all the countries have taken unilateral actions. But it's also about uh, the anticipation by the players, uh, including the tech companies. So if some want to adapt and to anticipate, I think they would be welcome. And I think that would be a smart uh, move. But 
we'll come back to that, I hope, next time we do a webcast. And uh, uh, we are glad to tell you all, uh, if you are interested in these webcasts, that uh, we'll do another one. We'll send an email alert to fix the date. And we'll fix the date uh, at the point where we will have substantive news to report to you so that we can exchange in this transparent manner. So we're glad uh, that we spent almost one hour together. And I will turn to Larry for the last word. But uh, thanks for the team. And uh, thanks to you all, uh, wherever you are, for attending this. And then for inputting, for sending comments, uh, we look at them all. And for attending the public consultations, please uh, register. Uh, you can do that uh, by going on our website. Uh, and uh, we encourage you to do so. In fact, thanks very much, Pascal. You have done the conclusion for me. Um, making the job a bit easier. Um, I was going to uh, thank all of you uh, for your presentations to begin with. I was also going to thank the uh, audience out there, wherever you're watching from, for tuning into the second webcast. As Pascal said, there will be a third. Um, we want to keep uh, informing you, and we want to keep the stakeholders and everyone interested in this project as informed as possible, offer as many opportunities as possible for interaction. Um, I'd also second what Pascal said. Go to the OECD website, look at the discussion drafts, make comments. The deadlines are there for when it's possible. Furthermore, if you're interested in attending the public consultations here at the OECD, please register. Space is limited, but we hope to have very full rooms. So please come. Uh, for, for those of you who are seeking further information, feel free to also uh, look at the website. There's uh, contact data there for sending questions, comments, violent objections, what it may be. So thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you sometime in the coming few weeks, maybe month, month and a half for the next webcast. Have a very good day.